By 1637, the tensions in New England between the English settlers and the Pequot tribe were about to erupt into armed conflict. In May of that year, the Puritan leaders decided they must take bold action. The decision to attack the Pequots was predetermined and was well calculated. The English authorities in Plymouth and in Boston and in Connecticut intended to make an example of the Pequots. The attack was planned by the English to be a massacre. The English purposely sailed their ships by Pequot country to let the Pequots think that they were sailing away. The English secretly landed in territory controlled by the Narragansett tribe, then marched overland toward Pequot country. Along the way, they picked up several hundred native allies from the Narragansett and Mohegan tribes. It's surprising that you have Indians who will ally with the English against other Indian groups. That's one thing that people often don't know about these conflicts. We think that it's Indians pitted against Europeans, but it's much more complicated than that. The Pequot relationship with the neighboring tribes is very complex. Some tribes they were at war with, some they were allied with, some they subjugated. Prior to the attack on the Pequots, the leader of the Narragansett forces had told them that he would like for them to spare the women and children as Indian people usually did in their warfare. The English obviously agreed to this or they wouldn't have gotten the participation of the Narragansett Mohegans. Traditional native warfare was very different than what you see in the Pequot War. Indian people, Mohegan Indian people, Narragansett people, none of them had any idea what they were getting into. May 26, 1637. In almost complete darkness, just before dawn, the English forces and their native allies, commanded by John Underhill and John Mason, quietly prepared to attack the Pequot fort at Mystic. Inside, hundreds of men, women, and children lay sleeping, about one-third of the entire Pequot tribe. You had a circular palisade, a wall that was built by tree stumps laid in a circle and pointing upwards and sharpened at the top. And that had two entrances at each side of the circle where the walls kind of overlapped each other and there'd be just a space you know, wide enough for a person to get through. The English troops rose and they commended themselves to God. And then they moved toward this palisaded fort. What they counted on more than anything was the element of surprise. If they could get in without being detected, they could achieve their goal of killing the inhabitants and taking away whatever spoils there were for themselves. Mason divided the forces up and they went to the two entrances and they found that the Indians had covered them with brush. They pulled the brush out of the way and they went inside and started entering wigwams and slashing whatever was there. What was there, of course, were women and children and men. They met with very stiff resistance from the Pequot warriors. John Mason felt that the resistance was too fierce. And 
he realized that they could not kill everybody by hand-to-hand -hand fighting. So he ran inside, he got a torch out of one of the fires, and he came out and he yelled, We must burn them! The English intent was not originally to burn the fort because they wanted to save the plunder. But Underhill and Mason were professional soldiers. They must have had a plan B. And that plan was to set fire to the fort, retreat outside the fort to prevent anyone from escaping. The Englishmen ran outside, and the Indians had a choice to make. Stay and die a death under fire, or try to get out. Those that tried to get out were either killed by the English and if they got through that line behind them, there was a line of Mohicans who finished the rest off. It was... It was horrible. The English themselves described this battle in very frightening terms. The destruction, the burning, the killing. There were so many people lying on the ground, Pequot men, women, and children, that the English couldn't even walk without stepping on bodies. The scene was so shocking that even some of the English began to ask if, as Christians, they ought to show some mercy. But Captain Underhill pointed to the Old Testament and said that God wanted those who were sinners, heathen, to suffer, he said, the terriblest death that may be, and that the innocent needed to suffer along with the guilty. And smoke. The massacre at Mystic took only one hour. One hour to kill hundreds and hundreds of Pequot men, women, and children. But it was far from over as tribe members who were living nearby were about to find out. After the massacre, the other Pequot villages attempted to come to their rescue. They saw the smoke and they immediately started to come towards the fort to see what had happened, because they knew their women and children were there. But they were too late. It was overwhelming for them. You have to understand that this is a moment for the Native people that was beyond their comprehension. They never fought wars to wipe out another group. Within a few weeks after the Mystic Massacre, the English began a systematic attempt to hunt down all the surviving Pequots. They wanted to eliminate Pequot leadership. They wanted to make sure that the Pequots would never again come together and be a threat to them. John Mason summed up the aftermath of the Mystic Massacre in this way. Thus did the Lord scatter his enemies with his strong arm. The Pequots now became a prey to all Indians. Happy were they that could bring in their heads to the English, of which there came almost daily to Windsor or Hartford. 